Hello everyone, and welcome in to this mini lecture on Introduction to Fiction Part 3, Sounding the Symbols. As I've mentioned before, this, uh, this series of lectures is inspired in large part by How to Read Literature Like a Professor by Thomas Foster. Alright, so what we're going to take a look at within this series, within this mini lecture, is a series of traditional symbols or things that when they pop up in stories, in fiction, whether this is stories you're reading or stories you're watching, you should be aware of and you should be looking for what else is going on. You should kind of see what's behind it. And the first one that Thomas Foster brings up is food. And he he says that eating is an act of communion. It is sitting down with other people and celebrating um, the act of being together. So people coming together and, and enjoying that. And so when people do sit down to eat in a fictional setting, the experience of that meal is representative, is relational to what's going on with the characters and how they connect to one another. A great example of this would be the film, uh, would be the TV series The Sopranos. In the TV series The Sopranos, it must be almost every, every episode, Tony Soprano is having something to eat. And there's this fascinating connection between how his meal goes and how he's relating to the characters. So, you know, it's, it's this idea of what we're ingesting, whether that is the, the actual food or the other person's presence, is going to determine, the, you know, it's determined or tell the reader what is good and what is bad. And so you want to be aware of this when characters are eating together. I mean, you know, in lots of scene, you know, lots of scenes throughout um, all of television and film and, and books, there's food, and there's this idea of taking in food or taking in people, and how does that change us? Is it good or is it bad? And if it, you know, the, the the thesis is, of course, if the food is bad, there's a good chance there's something sour about the relationship, and so you want to be aware of that and you want to watch for that. We also have vampires, and of course we have the, the, the traditional vampires, uh, the literal vampires that are, well, uh, largely abound in literature and, and storytelling today and have been a fairly traditional symbol for uh, over 200 years now. But when we're dealing with literal vi vampires, we're often dealing with symbolism around sex, uh, around sex, um, around se uh, sex, sexual interaction, around purity of uh, sexual beings, and whether this is even something like Twilight, where you have two characters who can't have sex. Or, or at least initially cannot, um, or you go into all the way back to Dracula, where the implication is that you know these characters are having sex, uh, they are violating, they are doing something impure, and thus are suffering the consequences for it. And we have to think about the vampire is a sexual being, right? And what do I mean by this? Well, you have this character who. What does the vampire do in order to turn somebody else into a vampire? Well, they have to get very, very close. In fact, they usually have to get you know, right up next against that person. And then they have to pierce that person. Right? They have to penetrate that person with a very sharp fang or set of fangs. And that act, right, to get into that person's bloodstream, that act of piercing a person which produces blood has a lot of parallels to sex or at least perceptions about sex and perceptions about sex before marriage. But we also have symbolic vampires and these are characters that drain other characters either directly or indirectly. So a symbolic vampire is somebody who within a story is you know, this negative force isn't necessarily the antagonist, but certainly can be a negative force within the story that drains the character of life. 
Um, a good example, when we look at Rip Van Winkle, you could say Dom Van Winkle is a vampire, is a symbolic vampire in the ways in which she affects or impacts Rip Van Winkle. But these characters are abound, and you always want to be aware of them and recognize they're not necessarily a the antagonist, but they're characters within the story that do drain, do put a wear on the protagonist's success. So we also have violence to deal with. Um, and violence is symbolism. We, see, we typically see two types of violence in, in stories. The character responsible violence, that is some character perpetrates violence, and then we have the external forces. All right, so the character um, perpetrating violence, there's usually something more going on besides that, but also with external forces, right? And external forces is, you know, out of nowhere a, a meteor strikes somebody down and, and obliterates them, or gives them superpowers. But you have those two types of violence, and both of them can, can often mean, and purpose, you know, will mean something bigger. So violence is often more than just violence. It can be symbolic. So I've mentioned this before, but the idea of slicing, uh, or in in Star Wars, the slicing off of somebody's uh, of Luke Skywalker's hand uh, can be symbolic, particularly by a character that is his father. You know, th there is you you can make an argument of you know the symbolism there of of almost castrating uh, his own son, right? That, that chopping off a, a man's hand, and in that case, the hand that held the lightsaber, and of course the lightsaber itself could be seen as a phallic symbol, so you can see um, action as representing or being symbolic of something bigger. And then there's also literary reference, right? So if a character is, you know, nailed to a cross, there's a violence in that, but there's also a literary reference to, of course, Christ. Um, so you want to be aware of the ways in which violence can mean something more than what it is. And it can sometimes be hard to get at, right? So, so it's sometimes hard to not really know what the violence means. So you might want to ask yourself, how does the violence connect or embody the theme? Um, does the violence connect or mimic other famous violence, right? And there, so there's a lot of famous violence. We could look at things such as duels, right? Showdowns uh, at noon at the OK Corral, right? That's f that's a very famous violent scene that we see play out time and again. So if you have two characters facing off, are they facing off like in a duel? Are you know I is the violence reminding you of something like David and Goliath? where you know somebody's throwing a projectile at the very large beast is it a is it similar to king kong where some you know are, are the, the protagonist or antagonist is, is climbing this the structure and going to be struck down somehow how does the violent make sense over other types of violence and so this is the question of ask it this is the question you want to ask is why this type of violence what does this type of violence communicate Right? What does hanging somebody symbolize differently than what electrocuting might be? Or beheading somebody? I know this is really gruesome, right? But we are talking about violence, and hopefully we won't see this much kind of graphic violence, but any type of violence, whether that is a, you know, a slap in the face, or a punch to the gut, or you know, getting trampled by horses. Why this type of violence? Why does it make sense? How does it connect with the theme, or the larger things at hand? All right, the politics of and in literature. So as I've mentioned before, you know, authors channel their culture and they channel the politics of their world. And that's something we always want to think about when we see or when we think about their work in terms of what are the politics of the work. And by politics, I don't mean are they Democrat or Republican. I just mean uh, within the story or within the world, how are they negotiating who gets what. I mean, politics at its basic definition is, you know, the negotiation of power and resources. And so you want to think about the politics within the fictional world and how that is a representation of the author's world. But we do see certain political 
themes emerge in works that are representative of American culture, that are representative of the way that we, the author is viewing or experiencing the world. So we have the self versus society. This is a you know very popular American theme of the self fighting against the, the larger structural forces. The challenges of power structures, right? And so this is not just the self, but recognizing the ways in which certain power structures um, create barriers for individuals or groups of people. Class friction, uh, we see this certainly, you know, the ways in which different classes are pitted against each other. Um, and this is socioeconomic class, but it can be, uh, it can be thought of in other ways, or it can be not necessarily just friction, but, you know, paralleling what goes on in the different classes or transcending classes, those kind of things. Uh, it can be justice and seeking justice, acquiring justice, running away from justice. Uh, these are, again, themes that are continual discussions we have in culture, in, in modern society, in every society, that bleed through into the fiction. And acceptance despite differences. So this is that idea of how to of reconciling this world of individuals. How how do we get there? Whether that's within the story itself, or or that's the story that connects to the larger cultural question of how do we recognize differences without creating boundaries around them. So something you'll see often within fiction, or I shouldn't say often, but whenever you see characters or anything taking to air know that there's symbolism involved in that so whether f you know when we talk about flying whether that's directly or indirectly right so f flying directly is a character actually being able to fly flying indirectly maybe they're getting on a hot air balloon maybe they are soaring somehow they're gliding or they're hang gliding they're getting on a plane um, they make a jump that feels like flying or even swimming, which can feel like flying at times as well. So you want to be on the lookout when a character does take to flight, because flying often means freedom or it means breaking away. You want to keep a lookout for interrupted flight, you know, a crash landing, a turbulent flight, um, a challenging flight, something that, that jeopardizes that flight. And what we're looking at is, of course, flying represents freedom. Um, it can also represent returning home, right? In modern days, when we talk about flying, one of the you know one of the questions I often see asked at airports, you know, are you flying to or flying back, right? Are you returning home? Uh, it can also be, it can also invoke spirituality. This idea of being lifted up. Right? We talk about within, within religion, within spirituality, of being lifted up. You know, my spirit has been lifted. And so there's, there's some elements of flight associated with that. We can talk about it as love, right? We take to the air. We're, we're, you know, we're on cloud nine uh, when we fall in love. There, you know, I feel like I'm floating on air is something somebody says when they're in love. We also want to keep an eye out for baptism, and we're going to come back to this um, uh, again in another in another work because uh, it, when we look at particularly Christian themes, but baptism is also something that we see a lot of, and we're familiar with it under under Christian auspices. But the whole idea of baptism is is interesting within fiction. It's interesting within storytelling. Whenever a character has been doused over or washed over, sometimes with water, sometimes with dirt, sometimes with air, um, you know, that, that we're symbolizing or we're talking about something bigger happening. So with baptism, we're often looking at rebirth, uh, renewal, right? We're looking at rebirth or renewal, kind of being a new being or emerging into some new situation. And it can be you know, it can be powering, empowering, it can be challenging, it can be traumatic, right? The birth process is often a very traumatic process. So you want to be aware of that not all baptisms are going to be happy, right? When we think about baptism in the Christian tradition, we're often dealing with with very positive experiences, right? So they're they're in a, they're with a community, they're being dunked under, they're coming up and there's a celebration, but not all baptisms at least when it comes to fiction, happen that way. Because if we're dealing with rebirth, well, birth can be 
a very yucky, challenging, traumatic experience for all involved. So what are the methods of baptism? Well, of course, there's a traditional method of water, right? So we can see in scenes where, you know, it's water in which somebody is baptized. They fall into a river. That could be a baptism, depending on the point in the story. Is it at a pit, is it at a moment of pitched tension that a character falls into the water? Well, that might be a baptism. That that cleansing may be what they need in order to see right. It can be by fire. We've heard this idea of baptism by fire, and that itself is is a metaphor uh, of you know a baptism by trial, by going through a you know something extremely hard. Um, if you've ever watched Lord of the Rings. In the final film, or if you've ever read the books, the, the final book, The Return of the King, you could argue that Frodo and Samwise have a baptism by fire. They go to this mountain where they ultimately are covered in smoke and they have to battle and you know Frodo loses a finger and all of that, that that's a baptism by fire. They come out renewed with a different view of the world. There's also baptism by earth, and this can mean, you know, being extremely dirty. Um, it can mean being buried alive. I mean, zombies to a certain degree are baptized um, by being buried in the earth and then coming back as something completely different. And even snow, or the character is being, you know, buried in the snow or falls into the snow or is being snowed upon, these can be opportunities or, or representing a baptism of that character, that they come out of it reborn or, or feeling a sense of renewal. And also, of course, rain. I mean, any kind of water form, whether it's, you know, water in the ground and a river and, a, and you know, in a pool, um, in a bathtub, or falling out of the sky. All right, so now we get to sex. Um, and one thing we have to understand about sex, if we're going to talk about sex, we have to talk about censorship. We have to understand that really up, into, up until the last 30 years, 30 or 40 years, um, Talking about sex directly in fiction, especially literary fiction, was a definite no-no. It just did not happen, was not allowed. People would, it, it wouldn't make it past the editors. And so sex got very much coded within fiction. And this even happened in film for, for a very long time, again, up until the 1960s, 70s, where sex had to be implied because you couldn't talk about it directly. You couldn't show it directly. And so there's a long history of, of censorship of sex, and all that really meant was that writers had to get creative. They had to, you know, create symbolic relationships or implications and kind of let the readers know, you know, kind of a, a wink and a nod to let them know what that something else is really going on. So one thing you want to look for in fiction, especially if you're dealing with sexual tension between characters, you want to look for symbols, right? So for female symbols, you're looking for yonic imagery. Now, what is yonic imagery? It's the opposite of phallic imagery. It's imagery that invokes uh, female genitalia. So you're looking for things that are going to, you know, invoke female genitalia. Um, th sometimes y you see a, you see references to fruits. Um, sometimes you see references to valleys. Uh, these are things that are, are referencing or, or if these are associated with the female, you know, th there's implications of sex or, or referring to the woman's sex. And of course, male symbols are abound. There, there's lots of phallic imagery that's used throughout literature, whether we're dealing with swords or we're dealing with, you know, buildings and statues and things that rise up. Um, there's an abundance of, of male sim symbolism, and male symbolism gets talked about a lot. But I think not enough. I don't want to say not enough people talk about it, but it's not discussed well enough about yonic imagery and th there can be a lot of it as I said flowers are usually flowers and fruit are often go-to's um, to invoke female sexual imagery or f female sexual body parts but there can be a, you know there can be a lot of other things um, you know mountains um, or, or the ways in which you know mountains come together um, th th there's a lot of ways it can be represented but not it it's less discussed than, say, male symbols. And sex, when it is directly talked about, is often more than sex. Um, and what we mean by that is, if it's in a story and the story is non is cons is not is not representing itself as erotic literature, 
uh, it's often the sex is more. Something else is going on. It's it's some kind of challenge, negotiation, or I mean, you can often find that sex represented in literature, you know, it is almost a bat. It can be almost presented as a battle or as a clash, or as uh, I mean, I, I've seen some sex scenes that are described almost as violence, and so you have to wonder what's going on there. What what is that supposed to symbolize? All right, thank you very much for listening. That's the end of this. I hope you have some tools here that you find useful as you jump into different works of literature. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.